Welcome to Lecture 4B, Human Resources Management. I'm Tom Stevenson, and we're going to be continuing on with our discussions on motivational theories and practices. Uh, in this section, we're going to look at some actual uh, theories, and I, I thought maybe we could start out with uh, Vroom's expectancy theory. And so Vroom's expectancy theory was developed in the 1960s um, after a person called Victor Vroom. And uh, it really looks at motivational force. Uh, what is the uh, combination of elements that actually um, puts a force behind people's motivation levels, like how much they're interested in something. And it's really... Uh, uh, where a person may choose to be motivated and go after something or not go after something, depending what it is. And it can encapsulate both extrinsic and intrinsic uh, rewards. Uh, so uh, Vroom, he believed that employees' performance is based on a bunch of factors, including personality, uh, skills, uh, knowledge, experience, abilities, uh, for sure, interests, um, those would be uh, elements or individual factors that uh, would drive uh, a particular individual. And what drives one person may not drive another person. That's a big part of how this theory fits. And um, with individuals having different sets of goals and desires, uh, they may have different expectations. Uh, they may be motivated by certain expectations or not motivated by other expectations. So he found there's a positive correlation between uh, the amount of effort that somebody puts in and the way that they actually end up performing. Typically more effort is going to lead to higher and better uh, performance. You'll see that there's some crossover there with uh, Angela Duckworth's grit, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, so a favorable performance uh, will result in a desirable reward. So there's that connection there and the believability that that will happen is also important. Uh, that the reward will satisfy an important need for that individual or a need that that individual feels is important, uh, being intrinsic. And the desire to satisfy that need is uh, strong enough to make the effort worth um, the reward. So uh, really uh, expectancy theory, it's broken into three different uh, areas. Uh, the first being uh, valence, and you can just think of valence as value. How much value does the individual place on uh, this particular reward that's being offered, all right? And um, so it's really the emotional orientations uh, that the individual has tied to the actual uh, reward and the depth of the want of an employee for that. So uh, if it's extrinsic, you can think money, promotion, free time, benefits. Uh, it also might consider uh, the demographic, the age of that individual, their family conditions may vary, and that may all have impacts on uh, how much desire they they have for that particular reward, you know, x amount of dollars, bonus, uh, time off, etc. And intrinsic satisfaction. So uh, if it's uh, you know somebody that is really interested in uh, the environment and helping the planet and climate change, well, if you're an employer and you know that that person is really interested in those areas, then that might govern which project you assign them because you might have one project that very much assign, uh, aligns with uh, that viewpoint. In maybe it's a, an energy-saving uh, uh, building design that you're offering them the opportunity to work on. Well, that would be of greater interest to somebody that they truly believe in that than perhaps somebody that really doesn't care about that. Uh, so if, again, you can start to see as a manager, if you have some idea of uh, what aligns with your employees' beliefs, you might be able to improve their intrinsic motivation by assigning projects that better correlate uh, with where their interests are. So that's management's job to discover uh, what employees uh, appreciate and value. And if you get alignment going there, that's going to get more engagement with those employees. Expectancy. 
you know, there's uh, different roles that expectancy plays. We talked about expectations in the last class. Um, so employees have different levels of confidence about their own abilities. And so you have to look at, well, they may have see value in the reward, but then do they think that they could actually achieve uh, the end goal? If they don't think that they can achieve the end goal, then their expectancy of a, you know, achieving that reward would be very low. And if it's low, uh, then there's not going to be a lot of motivational force uh, for that employee to want to succeed. So again, management needs to figure out you know, does this employee have the capability? Is there something in this particular project that is making this employee believe they can't achieve that goal? Maybe it's because they know if they follow the, the critical path through the project, they see that they need a key thing done by an employee in another department, and they know that employee won't do it, so they know that they have little chance of being successful. If you were to understand that and you were their manager, maybe if you cleared that path that whoever that employee's boss is knew this was top priority and that it would get done, then that would give more confidence uh, to your employee that they could be successful. So expectancy is the belief or confidence that you have to be able to uh, be successful. Kind of goes back to what I, I mentioned about goal setting and uh, Albert Bandura and uh, the aspect of commitment and self-efficacy, having the confidence to be able to uh, achieve uh, a particular goal. In this case, a reward, if, if we're talking about motivation here. So uh, we see that expectancy plays an important role there. Instrumentality, that's the third point. And instrumentality is, does the employee believe that if they do all this, they're actually going to receive the reward. So as a, in management, you have to be very careful that if you promise something to an employee and then you renege on that promise, that employee won't forget that. And so that's gonna impact uh, any kind of motivation they have on future projects. So if you, if you told them they would get a promotion if they were successful at that, and then they're successful, and then you don't even mention the promotion anymore, uh, if I'm that employee, you're not going to get me all motivated the next time because the next time I'm going to think, well, you lied the first time, so why would I get excited this time? Fool me once, uh, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, so to speak. So instrumentality is um, the perception that promises will be kept or that they will be implemented if the employee is successful. So the ones that the ex uh, expectations... Um, that we were just talking about the expectancy is more intrinsic instrumentality is what are you going to do are you going to provide uh, the reward as a result of this so it's kind of that thing that things don't always uh, uh, appear you know they may not always be as they appear so like this Escher um, drawing that shows that uh, you know being an engineering students you can get the drift here uh, that uh, this would not work. You may be able to draw it, but in reality, it's not going to work. And uh, so, yeah, you're promising this, but if you're not going to deliver on it, I'm not interested in it. So always keep that in mind, too. And Vroom definitely considered that in the formula. So expectancy theory suggests that employees' belief about expectancy, instrumentality, and valence, they work together psychologically and their interaction creates a motivational force that makes the employee act in a way that brings pleasure and avoids pain. Uh, so uh, it's really this combination of valence times expectancy times instrumentality that plays out. And if you have very little in any of them, then your motivational force will be very, very low uh, from uh, that point. So. Uh, Vroom proposed that the formula could be used to indicate and predict things such as job satisfaction, occupational choice, retention, the effort that an individual puts into their work on particular items, and having a good understanding that gives you a good reflection on where the employee's at. There's a sort of formula that you can see that can be plugged into it. Honestly, as a manager, nobody sits there and starts putting all these numbers in, but it does give you a good visualization of what's going on and how uh, the 
uh, Vroom's uh, expectancy theory ties together and the scoring and then you start to understand well if there's a low point in anything that that would actually um, really stymie somebody's uh, interest uh, in pushing to be successful so there's a little example here uh, you can check that out on your own but basically if you plug in the formula you can sort of see um, if there's a low motivational force and what might be um, causing the the lower motivational force and how that might be able to be derived to be something a little bit um, stronger if it's properly applied so if there's any elements that are pretty low it brings the the number down and the, the employee might not be as motivated as you would expect for example like i said if that employee was not seeing uh, uh, value in, or if the employee didn't see uh, have valence in a particular item, that would give a very low score on that. So let's say if you're successful on this project, you're going to win a free trip uh, to Alaska, right? And if you're not really interested in going to Alaska, I don't think it's going to provide a lot of motivational force for you to want to do that. Conversely, if the free trip is a Caribbean cruise and you love the heat and you love uh, that whole idea, uh, then that could be a, a strong motivational force for you. It's why you also see companies in their uh, benefits programs and things of that nature, they usually give you different choices, like there's a basket to choose from, so that you can be more motivated with the benefits of this particular program or the benefits of this particular um, offering. Uh, you can think of yourselves, I know when I do this course, very often, uh, students are being sponsored or at least a portion of uh, their uh, tuition is being sponsored by their employer if they're working for somebody and if that's that could be an attraction as to whether I go with company A or company B company A offers you know tuition for if I do this master's program and they offer me time off and I can be a little bit flexible to do exams and different things uh, whereas company B doesn't well then maybe I'm going to go to company A but company A should know that there's probably only a very few employees that are interested in doing a post-secondary or a graduate degree uh, while they're working. Uh, so that that's good, but there, it, it's not for everybody. So you got to have some other offerings that would be of interest to other people or some combination of things to better satisfy their valence towards those things. Uh, so as I said, uh, in application, don't think that somebody's sitting there with a calculator figuring that all out, but it does give you a good indication. And if you just even roughly on a particular offering wondered why somebody was disengaged and uh, you knew that it was perhaps because uh, they didn't have an expectancy that they could accomplish the task, if you could sort out why that expectancy is so low, you could maybe address that either with extra training or trying to remove the roadblock so that they could be successful at that. And that could make a huge difference uh, from that perspective. So that's a good way of, I think, thinking of Broom's expectancy theory and how it could be utilized. You can also apply it to yourself and sort of catch yourself on things. Hmm, why do I not care about this? Because I don't value it or I don't think that I'm going to be able to be successful at it or I don't believe my employer is going to provide this at the end of the day. Value valence, expectancy, and instrumentality and how they work together. Another uh, very well-known uh, motivational theory is McGregor's Theory X and Theory Y. And this is always, we'll probably discuss this in the synchronous uh, lecture, but uh, when we think about Theory X and Theory Y, uh, it has two views, right? And especially people from developing countries where remember we talked about cultures and different demographics and in North America today I would say there's much more theory Y than theory X that goes on if I went back in North America 30 40 years ago there would be more theory X than theory Y and if you went further back like where we said Fordism and Taylorism you would say it's mostly theory X and very little theory Y you developing countries, mostly theory X, very little theory Y still. Um, and uh, there's, McGregor would argue, as was the case when we were talking about uh, Fordism and we we're talking about Taylorism, McGregor would argue uh, that uh, if you're running 
company on theory X, probably the best you can expect is to be mediocre or average, uh, and you won't be great. Uh, so if you want to get into Jim Collins good to great category, you're not going to get there by being theory X. That would be McGregor's um, assumption. All right. And the assumption under theory X is going back to Adam Smith as well, is that most people disliked their work and they would avoid it if they could. Uh, so that's the general assumption. So that means you've got to manage them, micromanage them. You've got to watch them like a hawk and uh, not have your ex expectation is they're going to try to work as slovenly as possible wherever possible. So your job is to try to prevent that. So as a result of a th workers' lack of ambition towards their work, managers felt most people must be coerced, controlled, directed, threatened with punishment to get them to put forth adequate effort towards organizational goals. McGregor said that under theory X, companies would produce limited results or go awry entirely. Um, so that would be, you know, you're going to be mediocre at best. Theory Y, McGregor said, was an alternate view known as Theory Y, and it gives a, a, a more accurate assessment of the human condition. Uh, so, in other words, uh, under Theory Y, that basically people would find uh, work uh, is as natural as play or rest. That's kind of his perspective. Uh, that creativity and ingenuity are widely dispersed in the population, and if you create the pro proper conditions, people will accelerate and even uh, seek more responsibility. Uh, as I said, I, I think a couple of uh, uh, recordings ago, there was an employee that I was managing when I was a uh, director at George Brown, and uh, this particular employee took on a larger role than was required. He actually took on the role of basically three people because he really loved what he was doing and he really enjoyed it. Uh, so uh, that aspect of seeking out more responsibility uh, is possible. It's not a pipe dream. It's difficult to get everybody to do it, but the more people that you get in line with that and in sync with that, uh, it's making your job a lot easier. So this is the, your starting point is theory why, and the possibilities are vast for both the individual and the company. And uh, this is where you're talking about getting that return on investment, the, the benefits of uh, amortizing the costs of hiring over a greater period of time, because this employee, you create an environment where these employees will excel. So that's, that's kind of giving you the aspect of uh, McGregor's theory X and theory Y. Another one that I find most people have heard about, this is probably the most uh, popular one out there, it's often taught in high school and different things, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. And Maslow um, would say that there is this hierarchy of needs that people uh, obtain through their life. And you know, you may reach certain points at certain times. It's not a one-all for your entire life. Uh, you might be just starting out and you might find that you're struggling just to uh, meet food needs, shelter needs, safety needs, and so you're down here. Um, but as you grow into maybe a company, you have a sense of affiliation and belonging. That's that working with your peers, building relationships that we mentioned uh, a couple of uh, recordings ago. Uh, then if you go beyond that, you get esteem needs, a feeling of accomplishment as you get good at what you're doing and you're mastering a particular area of craft and self-actualization is reach where you're reaching your highest point and you're, you're helping others and you're feeling fulfillment in your particular area and you're not, you're not under undue stress to, to try to uh, maintain your job and that sort of thing. You have a high level of confidence in what you're doing and how you're doing it and it's exciting and you have a real sense of purpose. Uh, so this is where people strive to be. Doesn't mean some people never get uh, beyond, you know, the lower lower areas. Some people get fairly high and something happens and maybe they lose their confidence. So it's not a fixed state. It's a state where people will shift between different areas. But certain people are able to hover in these areas when they've achieved their highest levels of uh, accomplishment and self-actualization. 
So it's kind of a, a good base element to think about. And it may also help you in determining why certain people behave certain ways as well. Uh, you know, some people may be highly distracted because if you're not even achieving uh, enough uh, money to be able to pay the rent, uh, that has a, an impact. It's also why when we talked about extrinsic rewards, why at a certain dollar amount, people don't get that much more motivated. Like when you offer a bonus and people have enough that they can easily pay the rent and buy food and they're comfortable and they're not feeling insecure about that. Maybe they got a little bit of savings put away if there was some sort of catastrophe or something, economic downturn, uh, like a pandemic or financial crisis. Uh, then uh, beyond that, if it's going to require a lot more effort, you probably won't see them uh, that attracted to it if we're talking about extrinsic rewards. Intrinsic rewards are different, but extrinsic rewards... Um, there's a limit to where it's going to take them. For sure, though, it is going to take them through these two levels because there are, um, they need to ensure their own survival, right? And their family's survival. So uh, if that's why you see you know, people on minimum wage and that sort of thing. They are definitely highly extrinsically motivated to increase that amount so they have a higher sense of security, usually. So other current areas, oh, before I uh, go on, there's Hertzberg's motivator hygiene theory. You can look that one up if you're doing a little bit of uh, research on the first assignment. But uh, Hertzberg's motivator hygiene theory, it's really got two sides of it. It's one side is the motivator side, you know, what, what moves people and motivates people. And it, really it's built kind of on Maslow's hierarchy of needs is Hertzberg's motivator hygiene theory. But what it does also consider hygiene theory, that is, well, what are the things that they don't, they won't motivate you, but if they are absent, they can definitely demotivate you, like turn you off things. You know, uh, if you were working in an office and the temperature was so cold in that office all the time that you couldn't sit without, you know, your teeth chattering. Uh, that would definitely impact your ability to get other aspects of your job done. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of research in offices too. If you have more natural light, people are more happy, people are more in flow, that sort of thing. But it's not necessarily a motivator, but it's more a hygiene factor that if I'm just looking at a wall all day long, it's more of a demotivator than a motivator that if I have a window, oh, now I'm pumped up, now there's a window here. Um, so... Uh, it's uh, kind of uh, goes along those those terms. So it's actually a very good uh, uh, theory because then you're as an employer you want to be looking at uh, the conditions that you're creating and you want to ensure that you're not doing things uh, unconsciously that are actually acting as a demotivator. Uh, not that they'll motivate people, but they would act as a demotivator or slow down that person's productivity or interest in what they're doing. Some other current areas of research. So now we'll, we'll move ahead because those other ones, they're mostly like 50s, 60s. They've been around a long time. Um, uh, some more current uh, research. Uh, Mihaly, Sazink um, he's, he's got an interesting TED Talk. Uh, if you hear the word flow, usually he's associated with it. He's been a researcher on this for decades. Uh, and... Uh, it, we'll talk a little bit about that, but flow state is that state that you get into when you lose all track of time, consciousness, you're just right into whatever it is that you're doing. And um, it's, a, it's an excellent state to be really, really productive. Uh, it's like a train can go by and you wouldn't even notice it because you're so um, focused in on what you're doing. Uh, Peak Performance, uh, that was a book written by uh, Anders Ericsson. And he is uh, a uh, research professor in the areas of uh, high performance and people that have been very successful at different areas. If you've ever read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's books, uh, Outliers and uh, Tipping Point, a number of uh, different books that Gladwell's put out, um, one of the thing that, things that Gladwell uh, discussed uh, was the 10,000 hour rule. I think that was in Outliers. And 
the 10,000 hour rule was, you know, to master something, you have to put 10,000 hours of effort into that. And then after that point of doing that, you're going to be have mastered that particular thing. And 10,000 hours was kind of a number. It wasn't that it was a hard and fast number, but it was an indicator. And he kind of got, Gladwell got that idea from Anders Ericsson. It was funny because Anders Ericsson in his book kind of was correcting Gladwell saying, but what he really meant was 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. So deliberate practice is not doing something for 10,000 hours. You could go to a driving range and hit balls for 10,000 hours, golf balls, and not you'll get better up to a point and then you'll plateau and you won't get much better at that. If you want to get like Tiger Woods kind of good at it, you've got to have feedback. You've got to be getting the best coaches. You've got to be uh, focused on improvement, not just on hitting balls. It's like playing the piano. If you just go up there and you just practice the same songs the same way all the time, they don't change. You've got to have feedback. You've got to make adjustments. You've got to listen to it. You've got to try different things that will enhance the way that you play. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, it's a meta skill. You have to learn a lot of things to get good at it. And you've got to improve on those things. So the aspect or, or comment from that is deliberate practice, being able to um, focus on something with a conscious effort at trying to get better at it. Big difference than just doing something. I know a lot of people that have been doing something for 10,000 hours and they probably didn't get much better after about 3,000 hours. You know, they made a certain amount of improvement in the beginning and then they kind of plateaued and they really didn't get better after uh, very much after that. I know a lot of people, they get jobs and they work really well in the first couple of years and they learn a lot of stuff and then they kind of plateau and then they don't really get any better at that for the next 15 years. And then all of a sudden they're redundant and they wonder what happened. Uh, so if there's anything you take away from the course, it's this aspect of continuous improvement, deliberate practice and being able to get better at something that will really make a difference in your lives as well, if you are working with employees and you're a manager, if, if I'm a manager, if I can give feedback in a positive and impactful way, and if that employee feels that I have their best interest at heart because I'm trying to improve them, then I will have won them over. I will have somebody that's engaged with me. I will have taken the giver role, and that will be good for me in the long term, and it'll be even better for them. Uh, so this aspect of peak performance and what it requires is a very interesting area because Anders Ericsson also it ties a lot with what, what Angela Duckworth talks about uh, in Grit. Uh, Ericsson is like people will say, oh, Mozart, he was this talented guy. Like he, as a kid, he was a child prodigy and he was fabulous on the piano. And right from birth, he was just this pianist. Anders Ericsson said no. His dad was the best uh, piano teacher, uh, musical instruments teacher in Europe for kids. That was what he did. And he was really, really good at it. And so he had, I think uh, Mozart had a sister as well. Uh, they both got very good. But Mozart had a real interest in it, an intrinsic interest. He loved it. Other kids wanted to go play. His sister wanted to play and different things. He loved it. Uh, so he put his heart and soul into it. So now you've got a teacher who gives you really good feedback and really knows what they're doing, and you've got a kid that loves doing this, and you put them together, you are going to end up with a Mozart that way. Um, so that's, that's really important to understand that. It's also important that, uh, you know, there's always this saying that says, follow your passion. It's great to say follow your passion, but nobody knows what their passion is till they get so far into something. Like you have to be a little bit careful with that statement. Um, try different things, experiment with different things, and then usually you got to fail a number of times. And if you're still got this interest and you start to get better at it, then it starts to pull you in intrinsically. And then if it pulls you in the right way, then all of a sudden now you're intrinsically motivated in this particular job, in this particular field. And because of all the extra intrinsic effort that you're going to put into learning and mastering this, you know what? Your boss is going to pick that up. 
they're going to see that you've improved so much and you're going to reap the extrinsic rewards even though that's not what you really drove you uh, motivational wise so it, it's it's really important to think about how these little things connect and then trying to look at your own personality and how that plays out but also think of put yourself in a manager's position and how can you provide feedback to this individual without without uh, demotivating them uh, and getting them to, to pique their curiosity and fully engage them and help them along their journey uh, to where they're going. So there's a lot to it, and that's a few uh, quick uh, points on it, but uh, I think this is a, a lifelong endeavor, this whole area that we're talking about here, and I think you can't go wrong by knowing more and more about it and trying different things, experimenting with employees, how this works and how's the feedback, and experimenting with yourself, and then also understanding its tools, tools and techniques that you're building up, and no one tool solves every problem. Being able to pull from the, the toolbox different tools when you need them. So this is where also these theories come into play. And we'll look at grit, uh, and that's that'll come up too. Again, if, if you're wanting to look at this more detailed, uh, there are TED Talks. Uh, I usually put like a reference there. Uh, there are uh, YouTube videos where they're being interviewed. And there's, of course, the core uh, book material as well, which is very, very helpful in these areas. Um, so mahali has got a book called Flow, Peak Performance as Eric Anders, K. Anders Erickson. Grit is Angela Duckwork. And another one is um, Cal Newport. And uh, he's an IT professor, but he's really kind of taken on this uh, role of uh, looking at... Uh, how we are impacted today in today's environment uh, with distraction and how can we improve and have people better motivated we tend to be working on this sort of superficial level more and more and so his comment on deep work is well deep work is if you want lifetime job security uh, meaning that you'll have the skills necessary to be successful even if your employer fails or you have to move somewhere else uh, you want to do a lot more deep work and less superficial work. And so that means being careful that you're not spending your whole day on superficial emails, uh, that you're being distracted by social media, because the whole world is geared towards distracting you and getting your attention uh, today, and it's, it's winning. And so the aspect of being able to be motivated and more successful uh, comes into play with uh, deep work and ensuring that you... Uh, are able to focus for longer periods of time, that you're able to learn how to learn, so to speak. So just to go over flow a little bit more detail, uh, as I said, Mihaly came up with the flow state, and that's the state where we uh, really are doing the work, and it's really going along very, very easily and uh, it comes easily. Um, like this quote here, I've always wanted to be successful. My definition of being successful is contributed something to the world and being happy while doing it. You have to enjoy what you're doing. You won't be very good if you don't. And secondly, you have to feel that you are contributing something worthwhile. It's easier to get into a flow slate state if you are. And if either of these ingredients are absent, then there's probably some lack of meaning in your work and you're less likely to be in a flow state from what Mihaly would say. Uh, the first purposes of incorporation of Sony. So we talked about core values. So this would come into uh, uh, play uh, to establish a place of work where engineers can feel the joy of technological innovation, be aware of their mission to society and work to their heart's content. These are things that are, it's nice to say it. If you create an environment that doesn't demotivate you and if you can assign people that are in areas of interest that actually provides a motivational drive, going back to Victor Vroom, uh, you'll also get pe individuals that are much more in a flow state. So how does it feel? Uh, this would be how Mihaly would uh, define it. Completely involved in what we're doing. You're focused, you're concentrated. A sense of ecstasy of being outside everyday reality. Greater inner clarity. Know what needs to be done and how well we are doing. Knowing that the activity is doable, that our skills are adequate to the task. 
a sense of serenity, no worries about oneself, and a feeling of growing beyond the boundaries of the ego. It's hard to be in flow when you're on the lowest rung of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need because you're struggling to survive, so you're not relaxed enough to be in flow. Timelessness thoroughly focused on the present hours seem to pass by in minutes. Uh, intrinsic motivation, whatever produces flow, becomes its own reward. Hard to get into flow with extrinsic uh, rewards. Easy to get into flow when it's of interest and you're, you're being consumed by what it is that you're doing. And if you pause this, you could take a minute and you could think about what are some of the times I've been in flow and what typically uh, does this for me? Myself, I can get into flow very easily doing something like this, although I will admit it comes more easily when I'm doing it with a group and we're interacting more uh, in a live session. But if I'm into this topic and it's really uh, enriching uh, my thought patterns, I can find that uh, I wrap up this lecture and I think, okay, well, that probably took about 20 minutes. And then I might see that it was an hour uh, instead. And it's like, wow, how did that get to be an hour? I thought it just whizzed by the time. Um, so those are those are, are how that can work. Conversely, if I'm doing it and I keep looking at my watch, how long is this? How long is this? When's this going to end? I'm not going to get into flow. Um, so Mihaly has this sort of chart that he does. He's got one. Uh, he's got a, a good uh, TED talk, or at least on YouTube. He's probably got a gazillion on YouTube, but a TED talk uh, on this. It's a little bit dated, I think, uh, but. Uh, um, he definitely uh, has this broken down pretty well to sort of show, well, if I'm worried, I'm not going to get into flow. If I don't care, apathy, I'm going to get into flow. If I'm bored, I'm not, sorry, I'm, none of these I'm going to get into flow. Uh, if I'm nervous, but if I start to get aroused and interested and I feel that I have a sense of control, a little bit more uh, relaxed, these are starting to move me towards these ones here are starting to move me towards where I could be in flow, right? So arousal, interest, uh, I have a sense of control that I can do this, I'm confident. You're probably, that's, that's where there's some interesting debates that have gone on between Anders Eriks, uh, Erickson and Angela Duckworth and uh, Mihaly. They've actually debated this uh, back and forth because uh, they kind of uh, sometimes get a little bit at odds. So Anders Ericsson uh, would say, you can't get better at something if you're in flow, because in order to get better at something, you have to be really kind of uncomfortable with it. You know what I mean? Like uh, a pianist can get into flow if they're playing uh, a concerto that they're very comfortable with. So they're just playing that out and they're very comfortable with it and they can get into flow. But if they're learning a new piece and it's a quite complex piece, then that's taking like a lot of effort and a lot of concentration and a lot, they're a little bit nervous about it and that sort of thing. It's more difficult because you're gonna have a little bit more anxiety around that, right? Or a little bit more worry perhaps. Uh, so it's more difficult to get into flow. But if it's, you know, they're sitting down and they're playing something that they're pretty comfortable with, then that could definitely allow them to get that done. Or you got this project, you've done similar projects in the past, so you're not really got anxiety about it, but you just get into getting the work. And because you've got this special skill set, it just allows you to move into a flow state that way. So it's interesting how uh, these two, these go into together that way and how um, they, they compare with things. There's this uh, Yerkes uh, Dodson law that kind of says optimizing stress for performance. And it kind of ties in some ways to this because you know what, if I don't really care, uh, then I don't have enough stress on it. But if I have too much worry or anxiety, then that's a problem too. So there's, there's good stress and there's um, bad stress. So I need a certain, a certain amount of stress to keep me interested and uh, tweaks. So if something's too easy, I might get bored with it and not really care that much. If it's too hard, I might just get so stressed up out that I that I give up. Maybe I, you know, maybe it's a course and it's like, oh, this course is boring me to turds. Maybe it's just too easy and you don't really care that much about it. On the other hand, maybe it's so challenging that you want to drop it because you're nervous as to whether you're going to pass. There's kind of an optimal level in there where you feel you're 
learning something, you're getting better at something, and it's worth the effort, but it's not burying you uh, with uh, you know, stress and too much work that you feel that you can't keep up. So it's not a bad way of thinking about uh, performance and stress uh, there. You can see it in athletes too. Sometimes if there's too much stress on something, that's where they may, on a key point, uh, miss a basket that they would normally always uh, get. And if they don't care, maybe they're not putting their full 100% in it uh, for, the, for the actual uh, work or the project uh, for the game, in the case of an athlete. Uh, but if it's in the right level, they, they believe that if they put in uh, a high level of effort that they will succeed. Again, you can tie some of these to other theories like Vroom's. Um, and they have high value, valence in it, and they believe they can do it, uh, and they believe if they do it, they're going to get it. You know, it ties into this optimum level uh, there. So that can play into stress levels and how things are viewed as well. Uh, grit, as I mentioned, Angela Duckworth's research. So this is very, very current stuff. Uh, really, she's done a, a lot of research uh, cadets at West Point, well, how come some people stay through it? How come some people don't get through it? Uh, you know, you can think of the Navy SEALs and how difficult uh, it is to uh, succeed in the SEAL teams, etc., make it through the training. There's such high failure rates. Uh, what, what are some of the indicators that allow somebody to be successful while somebody isn't? And we talk about resilient, but she, she came up with uh, utilizing the term grit and what does grit actually mean and could she put a reasonable sort of formula to it. Sometimes things are easier to remember, uh, contextualized if you put a formula to it that it can have some, uh, some understanding of the application. When we're talking in, in subjective levels, it can be helpful that way uh, or qualitative uh, levels. Uh, so. One of the things is talent, the leading factor to success or mastery. And she definitely follows uh, the Anders Ericsson model. Ericsson's really sort of out there that, you know, you can pretty, taking away physical attributes, you can pretty much uh, get a lot better at anything if you put in the proper type of training and learning and learning how to learn and the processes in place. Uh, Duckworth really follows that uh, somewhat as well. She doesn't say that talent doesn't count for anything. It definitely counts for something, she says, but it's not the be-all to end-all. And there's many highly talented people that don't get nearly as successful at something as some people with lesser talent, but that have other attributes that they apply, which really is what provides grit. So... Uh, is, is talent the leading factor to success or mastery? And she would say, no, it is not. Some organizations have a singular focus on talent. Uh, this comes up. Uh, we like to believe, some, a lot of times when you see something, it gives us an excuse as well. Uh, when you see something that somebody's really successful at, at, at something, oh, they're so talented, right? Uh, they've, they've got such a natural gift. They're gifted. And that probably is doing more of a disservice. I'll have to bring that into another lecture, some of the work of Carol Dweck in uh, mindset. And she talks about having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And uh, somebody with a growth mindset thinks, I don't know how to do this. I'm use the example of mathematics. A group of engineering uh, students uh, Maybe when you were growing up, your parents told you, oh, you're fantastic at math. You had a teacher, oh, you're such a, you're such a talented math person. Um, probably the best feedback you could have got if you did a test really well in math would have been, you worked so hard to get that result. Good for you. Uh, that's a better uh, comment than, oh, wow, look at that mark that you got. You're so talented. Sometimes people that get that feedback that way when they're younger particularly um, they take it that oh i've got this natural gift towards that but then maybe you know you know yourself as the the math gets more and more difficult maybe you reach a certain level where you struggle with it and then all of a sudden you lose your confidence because you believe well i must not be that talented at it conversely somebody that maybe is not quite as talented as you were was told that 
you know, if you didn't do that well in the first test, uh, you can do this uh, with some more effort. You'll get better at this. Uh, and you had this sort of attitude towards mathematics. If you weren't doing that well, I'm not that good yet. Instead of I'm not good at math, I'm not that good yet, but I'm working on it. I'm going to get better at it, right? It's a different way of looking at things. Well, I don't have the, if you look at it, I don't have the talent. You're not going to put the effort in and you're just not going to do it. You know, you probably stick to something that you're better at. Maybe you're better at writing or different things like that. And you may lose that opportunity because actually if you get over those hurdles and you build a skill set. So Duckworth would say you build a skill set that knows how to deal with adversity so that when you hit a blockage, you know how to dig yourself underneath it, go around it, go through it, go over it, because you've built up all these different tools so that you can be successful. Whereas if you're just riding this horse of thinking that you're talented, and you know what, maybe you did have a little bit more talent than the average person, you may not go as far with that unless you learn how to deal with the setbacks, how to deal with some failures, how to deal with uh, the levels of difficulty as you advance. Because some people, they advance so far, but then they stop because it, to go further, it's going to take another skill set. It's also why when people are learning something, uh, a coach may be good up to a certain level, and then they need a new coach because they've gotten everything they could from that coach. They need somebody else that is got at a higher level or has a different perspective so they can tweak what they've learned and they can take that in and advance themselves further. So uh, the aspect of grit is that really sort of working towards that. The aspect of Carol Dweck's work, D-W-E-C-K, in mindset is the fixed growth set of Fixed mindset compared to the growth mindset. Fixed is more limiting. Growth is you believe you can do anything if you want to put the time and effort into learning it. We'll take physical attributes aside, right? There's that limitation. I'm not getting into that. Uh, I believe everybody has a certain amount of talent and some are more talented in certain areas. And probably if it's the area that you have no talent or lower talent in, that might not be where you want to spend your career because you could probably find something that's a little bit easier uh, that way. But definitely uh, to uh, limit yourself or throw out a whole area just because you haven't been good at it up to this point, that may be uh, not to your advantage. Uh, having a growth mindset about it uh, I'm not good at that yet, uh, can really sort of change your perspective. And if you truly believe it, it'll give you the motivation to persevere and work through and be able to build that up. And so that would be um, uh, Duckworth's point. Uh, she uses an example of the, the smartest guys in the room. That was Enron. Uh, they basically hired for, for talent. So they were just all about hiring the very best, high-scoring GPA uh, individuals that they could possibly uh, find and then they had this rank and yank, yank program how they rated them and they put them in competition with each other and they competed against each other and the lower ones would be yanked fired and replaced and so what happened was they created an environment where everybody was so nervous uh, all these talented people that they started to cheat the system they started to steal they started to uh, do things that were illegal and it caused a lot of problems It ended up uh, leading to the bankruptcy and the whole executive team was kind of corrupt in Enron at, at that time. Uh, so definitely uh, you got to be careful about what you're, what you're looking for as opposed to people that were much more willing to put effort in. And so the big thing with uh, Duckworth's theory is that um, if we have talent, talent times effort will build a skill. And skill times effort will build achievement. So her big thing is that effort counts once. The talent is only counting, sorry, effort counts twice. The talent is only counting once. Whereas a lot of this sort of fallacy that talent is the big thing is not there. Uh, even Michael Jordan didn't make the basketball team. Uh, the I think it was the high school basketball team uh, when he was in high school. There was another guy, even on his, wasn't wasn't probably the, if I was that guy, I probably wouldn't have been the most thrilled, but at the Hall of Fame, Hall, Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame speech, he has the guy from high school that he beat, out, that beat him uh, in that particular uh, 
tryout and made the team and Michael Jordan didn't make the team. Can you imagine? And what that did was it got Michael Jordan mad. And when Michael Jordan would get mad, he would put a lot of effort into getting better. That was his thing. Effort, effort, effort. So if you want to look at a guy where you're looking at um, grit, um, I think he would be a very good example of why he was able to get where he was. It was effort. And he expected others on the team to put the same kind of effort. In some ways, it caused a lot of um, a lot of uh, interpersonal problems with some players on the team. Uh, but another way, those t players tended to raise, uh, rise up to the occasion. It's a very interesting sort of case study. Um, Netflix has had uh, this um, uh, show on the history of um, sort of Michael Jordan and uh, uh, the Chicago Bulls. And it's a very interesting case in human behavior. Uh, there's some negative aspects to it. Uh, there's some very positive aspects to it. Uh, but I definitely think if you plugged in Duckworth's uh, theory on grit with that example, uh, had a certain amount of talent, but obviously wasn't, you know, the talented guy, didn't make the high school uh, basketball team. And if, if we were totally reliant on talent, should have made the basketball team. And uh, as a result, put lots of effort and saw success with that and sort of built the growth mindset that, you know, I can be successful at this and uh, I can put together teams and we can be successful on this and building on those aspects of trust and uh, those types of things. So definitely something to think about. And you can usually look in different areas when you're thinking about some of these theories and aspects of why is this person so driven? Why? What's the motivating factor here? And Think about things in that term, those terms, and deconstruct them a little bit, and see what what sticks for you, and what applies uh, for you think applies for you, and how maybe you can utilize that out in the work world. So these are all things I think are very very helpful. I think personally, I think this uh, lecture is uh, if you take all the related areas out there and you further uh, dig into them and you apply them over your lifetime. I think you're going to find that it it's a very, very important aspect for reaching success and your definition of success can be in many defined many ways, but you will reach higher levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, let's say as an example, um, by taking this in and applying it and thinking about it and working with others with it and coaching with, with it. Uh, as you'll see going forward as a coach, mentor, manager, uh, engineer in your, in your uh, career. I've got a few questions here. Maybe give that some thought before we meet synchronously and uh, probably be adjusting some things when we meet synchronously and so we can have some discussions on these areas and really sort of make it stick. I want to make this stuff sticky so that you can utilize it in the long term. So uh, that's it for uh, today. And again, at the end of this lecture, I would take a little bit of time to reflect on what resonated with you today and how you can apply it. Write down some points that you can think of right now. You might go back a few slides or, or uh, rewind a little bit and then uh, write down some points and bring any questions to our, our live lecture. And I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. I'm Tom Stevenson signing off for now.